can, okay, it's connecting now. Thank you, Hojam. Thank you for reminding me. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to IRSS um, on November 19, 2020. Uh, we are delighted to have with us Professor Charles Duran, a prominent scholar of international relations. Professor Duran, allow me to introduce him very quickly. Um, actually, it won't be quickly because his list of accomplishments is, is very impressive. So um, we, are, we are very delighted to have, uh, to have him with us. Uh, Professor Duran is uh, the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of International Relations, Director of the Global Theory and History Program and Director of Canadian Studies um, at Johns Hopkins University uh, School of Advanced International Studies. He also oversees the General International Relations and established, established the, school, the school's Global Politics and Religion Initiative. Before joining the faculty in 1979, he was professor and director of the International Relations Program uh, at Rice University, an analyst of structural change and security in world politics. Professor Duran created a, the power cycle theory, which he's going to tell us more about tonight, uh, of stage rise and decline, revolutionizing the static understanding of neorealism. His honors include um, Donner Medal, Governor General's International Award and APSA Lifetime Achievement Award in Canadian Studies and the International Studies Association Distinguished Scholar Award in Foreign Policy. Professor Duran has published over 100 refereed articles and books on the great powers, the origins of major war, Middle East conflict, oil politics, energy security, um, political economy and contemporary evolving power cycles. He has director major, directed major research projects on North American trade, Persian Gulf energy security, and US-German-Japanese relations. He has consulted widely on international political security for the oil banking and chemical industries, and is a regular advisor to government and the press. Amidst strategic developments, he, he was called upon to lead policy assessments, testify before congressional committees, and advise decision makers regarding OPEC, Gulf security, Arctic security, global energy, and threat assessment rankings. We are honored to have you here today, sir. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Professor Georgi and, and Professor Ozdemir. Uh, I uh, look forward very much to uh, this session and to the discussion that we will have afterwards um, what I it would like to do, with your permission, I should have asked before, uh, is to uh, append um, a, um, uh, just one second here, the, see if I can make this work. There. Okay, that's uh, just start with this and then I'll shift uh, off of it uh, as we get into the rest of the discussion. Now, what I wanna uh, remind our students is this, there are three things that we're gonna look at. First of all, what is power cycle theory? So we'll talk a bit about that. And I remind you that there was a video, I hope you've seen it about power cycle theory. You can go back and look at it and, uh, and uh, challenge your, your, your uh, analysis uh, uh, that you've heard here uh, by looking at that video. Uh, secondly, we are going to compare uh, power cycle theory with three other well-known theories. Um, and uh, I think it's, a, it's as much a contrast as it is a comparison, but we will try to give that our due. Um, I, uh, in my own classes, uh, certainly uh, do this kind of analysis. And then finally, we're gonna to turn to the question of a new data set and the findings and particularly the implications for policy, which might be a nice way to end our discussion because there are a lot of policy implications that follow. Uh, Professor Ozdemir. Um, yes, uh, Professor, I think the students wrote that they cannot see your presentation and I also cannot. So there's oh, some- technical. That's unfortunate. Uh, there's nothing I can do about that or you can do yeah. about that. The, can you just do a new share and go okay. where it shows you the PDF that you opened? Okay, so I, I do that and I, I'm not particularly good at these things, but here, now how about this? If I try this, does that hit? Can you see now, that? Yes. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Victory. 
Thank you, Professor Gorga. You My have pleasure. obviously technical skills that I don't have. <laughs> My students um, disagree. <laughs> all right. So uh, we'll start then with this question, what is power cycle theory? And what it is, is a dynamic, nonlinear understanding of statecraft among great powers. So let's take each of these elements quickly. Dynamic, that means it's changing over time. That means history is very important to us. That means that we believe that history is uh, crucial to looking at where we are today and where we might be in the future. Um, it's nonlinear because the argument is that there's a changing cycle of relative power and of foreign policy role associated with each of the great powers. And uh, so they can be located at various points on this, depending on what point in history we're, we're uh, looking at. We'll have a chance to, uh, to look at that in just one moment. Finally, we talk about the great powers. Um, it's important that we do this because the great powers are the ones that cause all the trouble in international politics, but they also have some of the solutions. And so that's why we tend to emphasize to, 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 to study them. Um, in the 19th century, the uh, great powers, of course, were five. Everybody could, in the room, I'm sure, could name them. Uh, France, uh, Britain, Russia, um, uh, Prussia, Germany, and uh, Austria, or Austria-Hungary. Uh, the United States is not part of that. Why is that? Well, by the middle of the 19th century, the United States had as much power as these countries did. But the United States didn't want to be part of the European Central System, feared being part of it. Um, and the other countries didn't consider it to be part of the system. So it was not until near the end of the 19th century. Today, uh, well, it, between 1945 and 19, uh, 1990, one could argue that the system was a bipolar system uh, where uh, the United States and the Soviet Union tended to be much more visible than other states in the system. But with the collapse of the, of, um, the Soviet Union and a collapse of bipolarity, a new system emerged. And I argue this system is now a six party great power system. It would include, of course, the United States, China, Japan, Russia, um, uh, the Europe, what I call the European complex. In other words, Europe is big and important, but it's so diffuse, it can't be expressed as Brussels. Uh, so what is it? Well, I think it is represented in effect by a security com community composed particularly of Britain, France, and Germany, even though these, even though Brexit is occurring. I think the, the security community still exists in that sense. So that's the way I treat that. And there's a technical reason. If you, we, we have a convention that if a state has less than 5% of the power in the global, in the, in the central system, it no longer is in the central system. And each individual, each of those countries would not be in the central system by our measure if uh, we uh, treated them separately. Uh, so that's, and then finally, on the outskirts of the central system, another state is rising and that state is India. And India, in fact, is growing at this point faster than China is. Maybe not today because of COVID, but, but in the last few years it has been and will continue to, to do that and therefore has a tremendous impact because of its population size and so on, on uh, the nature of this system. And I'll show historically why that's the case. All right, so that's what um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the general character of, of power cycle theory is, but it essentially has two parts. And the first part is um, the structure, the structural change. That's what we've been talking about. We'll, we'll go into that in a little more detail later. But it, is, uh, it focuses on structural change. Um, and that means changing relative power and changing foreign policy role, looking at both of those considerations. And the second thing that is important here is the impact that power cycle theory has on the probability of major war. Now, the argument is theoretically that there should be such an impact because the big powers are involved and, and it takes uh, one or more of these to to in fact get involved in a major war. Um, but the good news is that the empirical evidence also shows that power cycle theory is a very strong predictor of major war. Um, it is, uh, uh, in, in fact, I might as well say this, if you look at a book like uh, Greg Cashman's book, 
uh, what is war or what, what causes of war, I think is the title. What are the causes of war? Uh, the section on power cycle theory argues that um, all in between 1815 and 1990, uh, all of the major wars were included, were predicted if you include, if you argue that the Soviet Union was a belligerent in, in the Korean War, if you don't, 90% of the wars were, uh, were predicted. Now that's a pretty strong record. And um, that doesn't mean that all wars have been predicted by it. 35% only of the conflicts have been involved are predicted by the power cycle uh, framework. Uh, so that means a lot of small conflicts and a lot of nonviolent conflicts are not predicted very well by that theory at all. So the question then is, um, what, uh, what, how does this play out? Well, first of all, you have to, we have to make a distinction between relative war, relative uh, power, excuse me, and absolute power. Absolute power increases for most states on most indicators over time with some squiggles and so on, but basically it moves, moves up. Now, if you look at relative power, however, in every system you have 100 percentage shares of power. And those percentage shares of power are gonna be distributed across states in some fashion. There's a systemic upper bound, no, nobody could have more than 100%. But in fact, in reality, nobody has more than an effective upper bound allows due to competition for share. And that is this very substantially less than that. And as states rise, they compete more vigorously and eventually they reach a peak and they enter decline as new states come in uh, into this uh, se uh, setting. Now, this, um, I don't, some of it is, is cut off here by the, our pictures, but, um, but nonetheless, you get a sense of it. And you will probably not be shocked or surprised that if you're back in the, in the, in the 16th century, uh, the biggest state in the system was the Ottoman Empire. Now, a lot of people have a hard time <laughs> have a hard time believing that, probably not living in Turkey, but elsewhere. Uh, and it's partly because people in Turkey have a better understanding of this aspect of history. Um, but the Ottoman, I could give all kinds of reasons why I think this is the case. Mainly it's because it had the most territory, it had the biggest population, which means the, the most peasants, it had revenue. And when you go to Istanbul, as I hope I will, and uh, see uh, uh, Hagia Sophia or the Blue Mosque, you see where a lot of that money went, uh, and those beautiful structures. So, so uh, the Ottoman Empire was a very important actor, uh, but there was a big rival, Habsburg Empire, centered in Austria and in, uh, in Spain, particularly in Spain, where Charles V, for example, or Philip II uh, lived. Uh, and uh, th this was a big comp competitor. But that is, this is not, there weren't just two actors. There were a lot of other actors, particularly the green line, France. France was, a, and over time, the other two actors declined in relative power and France increased its relative power. And of course, there were other, other countries that were also very significant in all of this. Now, there's one country that's interesting. You can't see it uh, completely here. It's Russia. I'll just mention a word. Russia is the only country that has gone through this cycle twice. In fact, it's trying a third time. I think this time it's not going to be very successful um, because the odds are against it. It needs a modern economy, and it, we are having a struggle to, to create one. Um, but uh, it still is a very, very important actor. Uh, why was it so powerful uh, here? It was powerful here because uh, around the Napoleonic Wars, uh, it had a huge peasantry, had huge armies, and this had a great impact on those wars. But then Britain and France came along and the Low Countries, the United States and others, they industrialized, Russia did not. It industrialized very late, so it entered relative decline. And then as Stolypin, its finance minister in the end of the 19th century said, Give us Russians two decades of uninterrupted growth and we will show the world what we can do. And that's what they did. And well before the revolution, uh, they had, uh, with their rising, and of course, um, we know that um, de Tocqueville, uh, the, the sociologist the Americans love most, um, although he was French um, and became foreign minister of France, actually, when he, he lost his his enthusiasm about the Americans at that point. But he wrote the famous book in 1837 when he said, by the middle of the 20th century, there'll be two big powers. One will be the United States, the other will be Russia. Of course, that prophecy turned out to be exactly right. Now, 
Uh, I'm going to wind this up, uh, but I just want to say that be careful to distinguish relative power and absolute power. At the point when the increment of absolute power increase is the greatest, a state may be reaching its peak and entering decline. Uh, you could also see this if you look at something like the data on uh, absolute levels of German production of, of uh, steel here. And then you look at the relative level, you can see it leveling off. And 19, in, in, in um, 1913, the year before the war, it actually started to decline. And of course, would have declined regardless of the war after that. So uh, that's important. Now, the, on this cycle, there are points of radical structural change, a lower turning point, first inflection point, upper turning point, a second inflection point. These have massive impacts. Uh, they're unexpected but they uh, disrupt the system and create all kinds of political uncertainty. And at each of these points, the probability of major war is much greater than at other times on the cycle. Uh, we have now looked at that. Many people have looked at it repeatedly and they find that this is the case, that the, uh, these points of radical structural change are strongly associated with major war. At the end of this talk, we will come back to this, particular looking at these two points uh, for China. The last thing I want to say here quickly uh, is this, uh, the, um, uh, the relationship between changing relative power and, and um, the expectations of future foreign policy role and security are very interesting. For a long period of time, your predictions, if you're a predictor, if you're a, a, a prognosticator, will be correct. Uh, the, the, the slope of the line moves in this direction as you go up the curve until you get to the, this critical point. At this critical point, everything changes. And suddenly the slope of the line moves in this direction. So without doing any fancy math, you can all tell me what's going on here. What's going on is that there's been a discontinuity in expectations. Nothing is as radical, as troubling, as disconcerting as a discontinuity in future perspectives and future expectations. That's what takes place. And that's why there's a translation from here to there. I have to tell you that a student of mine, Neil Shanai, just wrote a book called uh, uh, Social Finance, which he applies this to, uh, to international financial crises. The economists love it because it's precise and they can explain why it is that the system freezes as it did in 2007 at one point in the crisis. Uh, it, it's because there's a discontinuity in expectations. So they love it and they've uh, applied it to uh, international economics now in, in, in various ways. All right, so that's it. I'm going to say that the one last thing is that uh, a famous, uh, not so famous, but a, anyway, a good, I think, painter, Ludwig Meidner, German expressionist, uh, did a painting called Die Ecke House in, in Dresden uh, as a German expressionist. Uh, he did this painting in 1913. Look what he sees. He sees, he feels the world shaking. He sees, he paints this house as though an earthquake has hit it. In the air, the oncoming war was felt by people in Germany and people outside, uh, and you didn't need political scientists to uh, predict this. Now, uh, let us uh, get out of this. I'm gonna leave this. And hopefully uh, we are now in a better uh, kind of interaction here, a, more, a little more direct. Um, the question becomes, how is power cycle theory different from these other theories? Transition theory, hegemonic stability theory, long cycle theory. Well. As you may know, uh, Kenneth Orangansky and now his student, Al Kugler, have worked out a transition theory. Um, and uh, let me take that first. And let me just say this, all of these theories, these are alternate ways of looking at the world of international politics. They all have some common assumptions. Let me mention what those are first. Everything can be explained in terms of an interaction between just two actors. That's the, that's the argument. The bulk of what's important in peace and war, as far as the uh, authors of these theories are concerned, is explained by what? 
by what they call a hegemon and a challenger. Now the hegemon, first of all, they claim that a hegemon exists in every period of history. So that's an important, uh, that's an important conclusion. Uh, but secondly, um, the, the, or, or the challenger is uh, very important to identify. Um, the transition theory uh, now, um, let, let me say another common assumption, a couple more common assumptions. One is that war occurs when the two actors pass each other in terms of GDP. So that's, that's, a, that's a, a commonly uh, sort of shared uh, argument. Um, and the, uh, the last thing is that uh, war changes the structure of the system in their view. It's not the other way around. The structure of the system does not in fact trigger war, which is what the power cycle perspective argues. Uh, so those, those contrasts are very important. Now, what's unique about the transition theory, what's unique about it is that it argues that the rising state is the one that uh, causes war. In other words, the challenger that causes war. Um, I think that, that is, uh, that's, uh, that's a, a very uh, uh, important thing to keep in mind. Uh, Organsky made very clear that he thought this was not a realist theory. This is a different, this is an alternative. Why is it an alternative? It's an alternative to realism because he rejects the balance of power. He says the balance of power causes war. How does he come to that conclusion? He says, well, when there is a uh, interaction among states uh, competing uh, together and there's not much difference, the interaction is very intense. And so that leads to major war. That's, that is his theoretical argument. Uh, he also rejects alliances, um, or he and, and Kugler together reject alliances. Um, in his earlier book, it wasn't so clear, but I think they came to that conclusion. And I can see why they came to the conclusion, because if a hegemon is as powerful as they claim, then it doesn't need allies. That's, that's, that's why you can reject it. Moreover, look at it the other way around. If you need allies, you're not a hegemon. <laughs> so there's no place in their thinking for for uh, alliances. Um, although some of the people who applied it and so on try to finesse that and try to test and so on, but I don't think the, the original insights of Organsky have been changed very much. All right, let me turn to the second theory, the hegemonic stability theory. This one is associated with, of course, Robert Gilpin at Princeton University. Um, again, they're just two states that really count, the hegemon and the challenger. But what's different about hegemonic stability theory is that it is, um, it's argued here that it's not the rising state that causes war. It is the reality that the declining state tries to defend its position, tries to sustain its position, recognizes that it's in decline and therefore declares war. Now that's a very different assumption from the transition people. Um, and uh, I have to tell you that the best part of his book, of uh, Gilpin's book on this, uh, which was written just at the time that my own work on, 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 in the American Political Science Review was coming out, although there was a lot of, it took three, three years after I got through the gauntlet of, re, of review to get it uh, finally published. So a lot of people knew about it and looked at it. Uh, Gilpin uh, uh, did respond to the, to the work, so he was aware of it. Um, but uh, I have to say that this book um, is uh, a, uh, a, a clear statement that, that Gilpin is a realist. He doesn't want to leave realism. He wants to retain it. And so he muddies the waters. I, I have to say he's not as clear or in precise as Modell's, as uh, Organsky is in this regard, in my view. But I understand why he wants to retain the, the uh, perspectives. For example, he wants to retain the, uh, the balance of power. But the balance of power he talks about is not recognizable by any classical realist. Uh, because what he thinks it is, is when the power shifts from the hegemon to the, to the challenger, that's, a, that's what the balance of power is. Now, of course, that is not recognizable by any classical realist. So you can decide for yourself whether he really is, whether he genuinely is part of this fraternity or not of, of realists, um, but he, he certainly thinks he is. Finally, let's turn to long cycle theory. 
I must say that I have a, a, a sort of an affection for this because I think there's something here that really is important to be said. Um, it is, first of all, uh, uh, much uh, developed and publicized by George Modelsky, the late George Modelsky, and his uh, student, former student, uh, uh, Bill Thompson at Indiana, um, University of Indiana. Uh, the long, long cycle theory argues that when there is a substantial change in economics, uh, in terms of production, in terms of immigration, in terms of the inputs into the economic process, this is going to have an effect on international politics. And, and I have to say, I find this compelling in the sense that if I look at Nazi Germany, I recognize that it rose at a time, it, it emerged at a time when Germany, like other countries, was in the Great Depression. And, they, and people were struggling and they were looking for strong leadership and they then uh, went to Hitler. Uh, the fact is, and, and once Hitler and others were in power, then major war was in the offing. So I think the relationship here between changing economics of this sort and, and, um, and war uh, is something to, to explore. The problem is, that they haven't been able to do it in a way that has convinced a lot of other people. For example, they argue uh, that uh, power is to be measured by the size of navies uh, or navies and maritime fleets. So it's naval orientation. And so therefore they argue that the, the, in the past, uh, Portugal, for example, was, uh, a, which and Portugal at that time was a great naval power, but they argue that it was the hegemon, not Spain. Uh, then they uh, argue that this, the city-states in Italy were um, at the center of the system and, and, uh, and were uh, dominant. And of course, that's a little bit hard because uh, there were quite a number of city-states. Uh, certainly the Ottoman was most aware of, of Venice. Uh, but uh, so therefore, uh, it's hard to put this together. Then um, they argue that uh, the low countries were dominant. And surely in the 18th century, get my centuries mixed up, the 17th century in the 1600s, uh, there's no doubt that, that the Netherlands was a very prosperous state, greatly great financier of many uh, op, uh, others, uh, and in fact, a great opponent of Louis XIV in France. But who is to say that they were more powerful than Louis XIV of France, the Sun King? Um, I think it's a, it's a stretch, it's hard to say that. But the theory uh, it tries to claim that. Then they argue more plausibly that Britain is the next um, dominant uh, hegemon. And finally, they claim that the United States is a hegemon. So um, this is the, the long cycle uh, perspective. Uh, I would have to say, again, there's something here. And I think there's something in each of these theories. The problem is that the empirical support, the quantitative statistical support is missing, as Richard Rosecrans has said in, in print. Uh, so the, the, uh, the, the support is not there, and that makes it very hard to, to, to maintain these arguments. I think they have seen part of the picture. I think they just don't have the whole picture. And I think in some sense they're aware of this, and that's why they're worried about how they've operationalized power, and they'd like to uh, maybe borrow some of the arguments from uh, power cycle, which is well, they're welcome to do. Um, but in, in any case, there are a number of assumptions that go into the theories which don't seem to work very well. Um, according, not to me, but according to others who are reviewing this work in the field. Um, and I'm sure your instructors can direct you toward both the theories and the critiques of the theories. Now, um, I would like to, uh, illustrate for a moment the problem that these three theories have with explaining international relations. If your theory is going to have some plausibility, theory of international politics, you have to be able to explain the origins of World War I and the origins of World War II. Uh, and the problem here is this for these theories. If you're just saying two actors are the only ones that count, then let's think about this. The hegemon is classified as Britain. And we can see why, because it had a world empire. So it looked, it, on, on paper at least, it looked very big. Uh, the challenger then was Germany. But the problem is 
that three weeks before the war began, Germany flip-flopped and completely changed its argument and said that Britain was no longer a threat and that they could, despite the treaties that Britain had with the Low Countries uh, to defend them, uh, could uh, German troops could march through this area on their way to Paris and the British would not get involved. Now that is an incredible change of attitude and somehow that's gotta be accounted for in terms of war causation, I think. But worse than that, the Germans, in 1913, we're not most worried about the British. As I just said a few weeks before, and they said that the British weren't a problem, which of course was wrong, but anyway, the, they, they were more right earlier. Uh, but what is uh, really striking is that they were most worried about Russia. And why is that? Because Russia had a huge army. It had an army somewhere between a million and two million people. And when the Russians made a mistake, I claim they made a mistake when they marched on Austria to try to drive it out of uh, Serbia and so on. They gave the impression that they were marching on the rest of Europe. And the Germans certainly looked at that in that way and said, we are the real targets of these soldiers. And therefore they declared war on the Russians. And finally, if you're trying to explain World War I in terms of these dyadic theories, which I, I, I submit is very difficult to do, um, I would say impossible. Uh, why is it that Germany attacked France if the big enemy was Britain? You see, it just, the, the, the arguments just don't work. And in fact, the empirical evidence supports this. They haven't been able to account for uh, either of these major wars, according to, again, a number of people in the field like Cashman, like Grosskrantz and so on. Uh, now, let's uh, turn, therefore, from this, and we can come back to these theories. I'm happy to do that later in our discussion. But we now have a good bit of time left to talk about the uh, new uh, uh, data set and what is involved. Let me just say, first of all, the old data set was very constrained because, first of all, it was done in, the, in far as far back as 19... I guess 76, when the first data were pulled together. Um, we didn't even have GDP for most of these countries in the 19th century. Uh, we had to find substitutes. And so we, we, had, we took a coal and steel production as a substitute. As it turns out, in the 19th century, the new figures on GDP and these figures are very highly correlated. So it wasn't such a bad estimate. Uh, but as you got into the 20th century, th these were less good in terms of, uh, of, uh, of a predictor, especially for a country like the United States. Uh, the other thing that, um, uh, that we uh, included, of course, was population size. We caused the territorial size, size of armies. Now, in the 19th century still, the size of armies is pretty important. Uh, at the Franco-Prussian War, uh, the size of the army was significant, although the bigger army lost. Uh, the better army won. That's probably a warning that things were changing. Um, but so armies uh, size was still important. But after 1945, army size became far, far less relevant. Um, uh, so therefore, we had trouble. We Our, our data struggled a bit in try, trying to explain things in the 20th century. We also had um, the, uh, I said the military size, the army, but we didn't have much of a measure of uh, technolo technological change at all. Now, what about the new data set? The new data set is for, is the period between 1990 and 2017. And these are some of the variables or the variables, I guess, that are included in this. Um, we did have GDP to work with. We did have pretty, pretty excellent measures of per capita income as well, GDP over population. Uh, we did use population size. We continue to think that is relevant, maybe not as relevant as before, but it still is relevant. Um, and certainly uh, military spending. And then much more important, we think, are the variables that Posner at MIT, for example, pointed to, and we independently came to the same conclusion that what we should be measuring is power projection. 
And so we, in this, we included then as indicators, the number of aircraft carriers, because during peacetime, aircraft carriers are the method of projecting power. Um, I say during peacetime, because in a nuclear war, they might be pretty easy targets. Um, and then the other uh, indicator of military power, we think, is uh, the number of submarines with nuclear capability. Um, because uh, that, those in American language jargon, so, the so-called boomers, because they are the ones that really have uh, uh, an indication of how important missiles are, how important command and control is, and so on. Finally, we, had, we wanted an index of technological development. And so what we decided on was artificial intelligence. We said that's going to be, that's an important variable. It's going to be an even more important in the future how to measure it. Now, there are a lot of data on, um, on patents. And so a lot of people will use patents. And if they do, they're going to completely bias the results because there are patents and their patents. The Chinese, for example, patent everything. So they've got hundreds of thousands of patents, but most, pat most of those patents don't have any impact whatsoever. So what we decided we would use instead is the number of articles discussing and describing artificial intelligence controlled for, controlled for by the number of citations. Because we wanted the really important articles, the ones that really were going to be of, uh, of uh, some significance. And so that's the measure that we use for technological change. Now, I have to tell you, we in the process of doing this, we have now a draft article out um, on this. Um, we looked at Beckley's work, for example, some of you will, will be very familiar with that. Uh, he argued that one should not use GDP plus per capita income, one should use GDP times per capita, per capita income. Now, if you just look at that alone, that of course means that the United States and Europe and so on and Japan, they just shoot up and they look fantastic. Um, he says that this captures efficiency and, and we find that he's correct on that. We think he's right. But we think that you have to put this in the context of these other variables. And when you do that, you realize that he has accounted for increased efficiency for the United States and, and for uh, Japan and so on. Um, but uh, it is also the case that the other, other indicators, military and economic, are very important and have to be included. And so we included the whole, we, we put everything together and got very, very fascinating results. Now, um, here is what I'd like to do at this point. I'd like to say something about this whole process of doing data and of doing the empirical part. Uh, let me start by saying, what is power? You know, we wrestled with that. And what we discovered is, I don't know how many people you have in the room, but as however many people you, well, in the room, the virtual room, uh, how many ever people there are in the virtual room is how many definitions of power you'll have. So that's very frustrating for academics and others who are looking at power. And in fact, at the time we did this, there were some people who said, because we can't reach an agreement on power, power doesn't exist. <laughs> well, I can tell you at my institution, Professor Ustegar, I certainly can, can I think, uh, confirm this. Nobody would believe that. You'd be laughed out of the room. So how do we deal with this? What we did is we decided on a different approach. And I must say, I'm, I'm rather proud of this. The economists copied us later, did the same thing for some other work that they did. Um, I have to say that because we are so influenced by the, by the economists. Uh, what we said is, all right, we're gonna find experts on international relations. And then we're gonna ask them to define power for themselves. But then we're gonna say, take that definition that you have and take these 10 countries that we have selected randomly in the international system and rank them. And we're gonna find out whether you people really understand what power is or not. Because if you don't, there's not gonna be any agreement. If you do, <laughs> that strongly suggests that everybody is able to communicate about power. They understand what power is. Well, as it turns out, we were shocked at the discovery because what happened was we discovered that we got a 90% agreement over the rankings of these states in terms of, of power. Wow, in social science, that's, that's sort of breathtaking. 
Um, then we said, well, maybe there are cultural differences. So I had students in Japan, in Latin America, in Canada, in Finland, some other places. So I asked them all to, to, uh, to apply this test to their uh, experts and to give us results. And we were prepared for a real cut, a decline in good results. Uh, it, shockingly, that didn't happen. Culture didn't matter. For the experts on international relations, they understood what they meant by power across cultural differences. Well, now you think about it. Of course, that's true. How could diplomacy take place? How could statecraft take place if people didn't understand what power is? So, you know, we should have recognized that that was going to happen any, already. Um, a second thing I want to say about this process of, of, these, uh, of collecting the data and creating the indexes is these. There's a right way to create a power index and there are a thousand wrong ways. Let me suggest what I think the right way is. And this came after agonizing theoretical analysis and empirical work and so on. Let's say we're looking at the relative power for the United States. Relative power for the United States is the absolute power of the United States over a ratio over the absolute power of the United States plus the absolute power of each of the other great powers. That ratio ultimately will tell you what the relative power of the United States is. Let me give you quick, quickly one example of what we mean by absolute and relative. Absolute power is the number of, of ships that you have in Turkey. That's, those are the number, that's, that's absolute power. Relative power is the number of ships you have relative to what the Russians have. That's, that's relative power. So uh, it's important to keep the distinction clear. And when you do, it all seems so simple and obvious, but let me tell you, it isn't obvious and it took forever to get to this conclusion. Um, now, uh, that's the, that is the definition of what power is. Let me say one, uh, one other thing, and then I'll talk a little bit about policy conclusions and we will open it up to discussion. We still have 16 minutes left by my, by my clock. So I hope I'm, hope I'm right about this. Um, the, um, the, the, there is an important uh, thing at work here. You should, if you're measuring power, you should try to find indicators that cover all aspects of this concept. That's just a property of how you do index construction. You should always index a concept by looking at all of its aspects to the extent that you're able. But secondly, what we uh, believe is important is that these indicators should be uncorrelated with each other. Because if they're highly correlated, you're just replicating things. Now you have to be very careful about this because um, it's possible to go too far in this direction. And in, for my money, uh, I think the, uh, the, uh, the three theories we looked at uh, and their theorists have not gone in the right direction because what they've said is GDP explains everything. Because you have GDP figures throughout the whole thing and it's growing, you don't need any other indicators. Well, I can do a th thought experiment and show you that if you don't include military considerations, you're going to look very um, disjointed, let's say. Uh, you're going to be very awkward uh, in terms of your outcome uh, if you don't include the military dimension. Now, the economists come back to us, our friends, the economists, and they say, Duran, you can't do this because you're adding apples and oranges. You're adding military considerations and economic considerations, and demographic, and you can't do this. And of course, our response is this. We're not measuring these things. We're indexing them. And we can combine indexes if we do this properly. Moreover, you say we're adding apples and oranges, and of course you're correct, but what we're really doing is combining fruit and vegetables at a different level of generalization. All right, um, so that's where we stand. Now, what did we come up with? What did we, have we so far uh, found? There are three questions that we were most interested in. The first question was, um, and is, uh, is the one that is occupies more space in international journals than perhaps any other. And that is, is the United States in decline? Everybody's curious about that. 
So we wanted to be able to answer that question. Second question is, will the surge in Chinese power, which is very real, very genuine, will that continue? Will it just go on and on and on? And the third question is, does that mean then that China will eventually in the 21st century dominate the entire system? Will it become the hegemon for the whole the system as a whole and certainly in, in its own region? So I think those are worthy questions. We had some other questions too, but those are, those are the three that we'll talk about here. Uh, let me take them in order. The first one, remember when you're doing dyadic analysis and you talk about relative, you're not really measuring relative because all you're measuring is when one state goes up, the other state goes down. When one state goes down, the other state goes up. They're just the opposites of each other. But true relative change is when there is change across multiple actors. So it's possible for, for states to be rising and declining here in very interesting ways on their relative power cycles. Um, when we look at the question for the United States, we find this probably, as Kissinger said in the, at the time, and he's a great historian, doesn't know anything about data analysis. Political scientists don't quote him because he's not relevant. They don't, does not do data. Uh, he, the real truth is he doesn't like data. I'll, I'll tell you an anecdote, okay? Quick anecdote. Uh, he applied for a job when he didn't, was turned on initially at Harvard. He applied for a job at MIT. And Charles um, um, Kindleberger was the person who was interviewing him. And Kindleberger rejected him because, quote, he wasn't a modern political scientist. Wow, what a mistake. Huh? That is a big time error. Um, he may not be a st statistician or a political scientist, but he understands history like virtually nobody else does and um, has great insights. And he said in 1970 that the dawn of the superpowers was drawing to a close. What does that mean? Take it out of the poetry and, and state what it means. It means that both the Soviet Union and the United States were had reached their peak in terms of their relative power. Now, for very different reasons and in different ways, uh, but, uh, but in any case, there, that's probably where the peak took place. Now, at that time, the United States was overwhelmingly the biggest state in the system um, without any question about that. What about today? That's what people are asking. What about today? Well, guess what? The United States is the biggest actor in the system in terms of economics and in terms of military considerations. However, there's been some change. The margin is not as great as, as it was. There has been some, a little bit of decline and that has been interrupted, of course, by the interval between 1990 and 2000, 2005, the interval of unipolarity. And yes, unipolarity did exist, but what we show and what others can't because they don't have a dynamic analysis, power cycle theory is dynamic. We discovered a lot of people don't like that, but that's because it's very revealing. It shows all the blemishes. Uh, the United States did increase in terms of relative power during this period, but guess what? Some of that power from the, from the collapse of the Soviet Union, some of that power went to China, some went to India, some went to even to the European states, uh, but most of it went to the United States, but it didn't last very long. And by 2005, the United States was back on its power cycle exactly where it would have been if unipolarity had never occurred. Now, I can tell you that message isn't always received with great glee and enthusiasm here in the United States. But what we're trying to do is do analysis, not to try to please uh, the press or the public. Uh, but bear in mind that nonetheless, the, the decline has been very, has been very, very slow. You know, it, the trajectory is clear, but it's very, very slow. And that's understandable. This cycle is hugely long. Uh, it probably took, depending where you wanted to start, at 150 years to get to the peak. So it's going to take a long time to get uh, down on the other side, and there could be a big flat uh, plateau at the top. Um, now, uh, let me uh, turn to, to the next question. 
will the surge in Chinese power continue and go on and on and on forever? Well, what we have discovered, what we have been able to identify empirically and what we knew had happened, but we couldn't, now we have evidence for it, is that China has passed through its first inflection point. What does that mean? It means that although the level of Chinese relative power continues to increase, the rate of that increase is falling off and it is falling off very fast, very, very fast. There's an internal reason, which I won't get into, which is the economist's explanation, but there's an external power cycle reason for this as well. And the external power cycle reason is this, it's exactly what happened to Germany. Germany at its peak or entered a peak because another state was taking power share away from Germany. As von Moltke, the German chief of staff understood and all of his staff people, they understood it perfectly. We, we went to the archives, we have the statements of that. They understood what was happening to them and they even understood which state was causing the problem for them. They understood it was Russia. What Russia was taking power share away from Germany, forcing it into uh, eventually into relative decline. Now, in the 21st century, what's the, the relationship? The relationship here is between China and that pygmy in power terms, India, rising very rapidly from the outskirts of the system. And as it rises, it takes power share away from China and forces it into decline. Is, is it at all surprising that China is trying to impinge on India and India is responding that there's tension between the two states? I don't think there's any surprise about that at all because China's gone through this inflection point, there's huge political uncertainty and this is spilling over on the system in a way which is, which is quite troubling. So uh, that's the case, the, the Chinese uh, powers. Now I could go into this, we've got a lot of other analysis to support this. Uh, for example, to this year, the ratio, the so-called dependency ratio in the Chinese population has changed dramatically. That is the number of people who are working over the number of people who are dependent. Um, and that ratio has just plummeted this year and it's gonna continue like that for the next five years. In other words, they're, the population is aging very fast. Somebody's going to have to take care of those people, and they don't have enough workers coming in to to uh, to increase the the labor base. Although they have certainly a lot of potential labor out there in the wings, 400 million people living still on the land, so they're not without that uh, that capability. But it is a problem for them to bring those people into the cities. Um, now, so that's uh, that's the situation for uh, that question. The second question. What about the third question? Will China uh, dominate the system? Well, we argue that there are several scenarios we have to look at. We are in the process of elaborating those, um, but there's one common conclusion. And that conclusion is sooner probably rather than later, China will peak in terms of its relative power. Now, that's unthinkable today. People reject that. Mostly they reject it in Beijing. They don't wanna hear it. Xi wants China to be the biggest country in the world by a large margin, wants to dominate the local region, and then wants to dominate the international system. There's, all of these speeches about the liberal trade order are for us to read. That's not the way they conduct themselves in reality, not at all. Uh, they, in fact, are interested in power. And believe me, they understand power in a lot of ways. They're, they're, they're a culture that's very hierarchic. And so as one uh, diplomat unwittingly or carelessly said to some states in the region, ASEAN states, he said, we Chinese are big, you are small. It would be wise for you to remember that. That's pretty brutal. That's the new world, that's the new world of power politics that has descended on all of us. Um, so uh, what uh, we can say is this, that China is going to peak. The question still remains at what level and we're working on that and others of course will be working on it too. Uh, and how soon, that's equally important. 
uh, we'll have to see. But the fact is that there is going to be that. Now, if that did not happen, suppose that, that um, China did double its economic size and nobody else was even close um, by the middle of the 21st century. And they decided to use force to impinge on other states. Well, if that took place, there'd be a balance of power. And you would see just like that, uh, the NATO countries, India, uh, Japan, Australia, all sort of swooping in and encircling China. I hope that doesn't happen because I think that is a very unstable kind of situation. But it won't happen if China doesn't use its power excessively. But that's up to what up to the Chinese, and we don't know what their preferences are going to be. We, on the other hand, are very much involved with them. Uh, I, I think you're certainly you certainly see that. Uh, Europe is not. For some reason, Europe is much more concerned with its internal problems or problems in the Mediterranean Sea or something of that sort. And China seems a long way off. But I can tell you, within a few years, you will feel the hot breath of the dragon as well. And it has it is going to have significance, great significance for you. So I will now conclude in the last two minutes with this thought. Power cycle theory is an effort to try to look at the dynamic long-term changes in the relative power of states and the impact this has on the stability of the system. We find that it does explain a great deal of the pro increased probability in major war. Um, and we find that it does account for the changing relative power of states over time. That, con that power is gonna change is gonna continue throughout the 21st century. And that means that you and I We'll have a lot to talk about and a lot to analyze. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Professor Duran. That, that was wonderful. We really appreciate it. Uh, and, and your timing was, was just perfect. So uh, I'll open the floor up for questions and at this point. Um, students um, are asked to use the raise hand function in, in Zoom. And I can see already that there are quite a few of them. <laughs> who um, would like to, uh, to, um, to, to, to talk to you and to, to engage with the, the very compelling ideas you presented. So I'll go first to Edda Gensch. Hi, um, thank you. Professor, what I'm most curious about is um, to what extent do you think this theory is a product of its time and place? Um, do you think it's um, uh, driven by an um, American perspective, or how would you face that criticism? Do you think um, new practitioners of this theory are likely to change it, uh, apply it to uh, cases which may or yeah. may not include great powers or which may include more sub-level uh, analysis? Okay, you've asked a number of good questions, okay? So let me try to sort them out. First of all, your, to your, uh, in response to your question, is this an American theory? Well, I, I'm sure there's some characteristics of it and, and of its uh, originator that are inextricably, uh, unavoidably uh, American. But let me tell you, this is not a, a theory that's designed to flatter the Americans. In fact, I would say a lot of people reject it uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, not having much to do with the uh, statistical reliability or the historical reliability of the theory. So the answer is it applies to all the great powers. Now, why do I say great powers? Because I'll let you in on a little secret. If we, if we did this for the entire international system, what you'd find is that the amplitude, that's the, the movement up, is just a little blip and it would be invisible. Everything would be flattened out because there's too much variation in the denominator to reflect the, cycle, the actual cycle that's going on. So that's a technical explanation for why that doesn't work. Um, but it works beautifully for the great power system. Now, does it work, and this is your second question, does it work for any other systems? Does it work for regional systems? And I have to tell you that I thought it would not. And the reason I said that it would not is because I thought the great powers would impinge too much on the regions and you know, sort of obliterate the effects because of the foreign aid and the military presence and so on. But as uh, Professor Ustamar and, and Professor Georgia probably 
would agree with me on, we're, we instructors are meant to be wrong and proven wrong by our students. And one of my students, uh, Andrew Parasoliti, who later worked for the Rand Corporation, became a vice president, now is president of a big broadcasting company, uh, essentially to the, to the Muslim world, um, said, no, you're, you're wrong. And he spent a year collecting data on the Middle East countries. Uh, and he proved that there are cycles among those states. And not only are there cycles, but there are cycles with consequence. Because he showed that prior to uh, the first Gulf War, Saddam Hussein had peaked in terms of relative power and was looking around for what to do, was facing a huge debt that he couldn't pay off. And this stimulated him to think about grand plans for expansion, invasion of Kuwait, with, of course, the subsequent plan to intimidate the Saudis and then control all of oil pricing. This was, the, this was obviously the, the, the uh, pious hope that he had gone through. Um, and, and that was too much for the other states. And so the UN forces uh, opposed him and, um, and that was the end of that plan. And, and, the, and the Kuwaitis were restored to their proper place as an independent country. Um, so what I would say is this, yes, if you collect the data carefully and, and look at it carefully, you will see the cycles. Now there is a big difference in the Middle East cycles or the regional cycles and the other cycles. And the big, one big difference is there's, the amplitude is not very high for the cycles and the periodicity is pretty short. Periodicity is how long the cycle is. And so uh, the combination of these two mean that it's a different kind of cycle, but it's there and it's available for analysis if you, uh, if you collect the data right and do, uh, do the analysis correctly. Thank you very much, Professor Duran. Um, Madeline? Yes, first of all, um, just thank you for speaking to us tonight. I really enjoyed it. Um, my question had to do with specifically your, or the, um, dynamics of changing system structure, the graphic mm -hmm. from 1500 to 1993. Um, just because I was curious about what kind of criteria um, or like what baseline those great powers had to have to go onto the chart, because mm -hmm. especially with China, I don't think it was on there until like 1950. Mm -hmm. And I think if it had gone before, then maybe it could have been like Russia and having more cycles. Okay, so you're asking, a complex set of questions. I'm going to try to reduce them to two, and they're both very good questions, very central. Questions. But I may forget the second one before I. So you got to remind me of the one about uh, about China and, and cycles. Um, what about um, the um, what, what indicators are we using here, and so on? So I, I didn't have time to explain that, so you're really correct. Are you an empirical researcher? <laughs> because that's the kind of questions that empiricists ask. Um, we use data between 1815 and about, I don't know, the late 1980s. We had data for that. They were the original data set. By the way, for those of you who are, are specialists on this, you'll know um, when uh, David Singer, the late David Singer, at the University of Michigan, who's the, was the co-founder of the Cal data set, uh, asked me for our sources on power. So it isn't surprising that when you look at our original power index and the cow index, they're almost identical because he used our sources in order to create the original uh, power rankings for the cow set. Uh, that's not generally known, but, the, but it is a fact. Um, now, what about then the period before 1815? Well, what I tell people is this, I say, you know, the truth is that what happened between say 1500 and 1800 is essentially Duran's imagination. Now that's, that's, that's not really true because I'm using historians judgments. And what historians are really good at is identifying who's ahead. So they tell you when a state peaks and they tell you how big they are relative to other states. So given that information from historians, it was possible for me to extrapolate backwards from where they were when they had, when, where we had data 
to find out where they were to, in a previous period. And that's how we did the, the previous uh, cycles. So these cycles, and, 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 and to show you how you're thinking in the right lane, um, a professor of uh, international history at Harvard uh, used the book, The Systems of Crisis in his class. And he confronted me afterwards. That, I have to use that word, it's, it was that strong. He said, my students showed you that you're wrong. He said, you think that those cycles that you have drawn up there are smooth curves like that. But he said, there are all kinds of things that would cause countries to go in different directions. There are wars, there are um, depressions, there are booms, why aren't these reflected? And so what I later told him, a little bit late, too late to get it into his class, but later I said, I'm very sorry, but I think I said that these are idealized curves and they are fitted curves. They're fitted through either annual points of data or five-year points of data. Those points of data fall off the curves above or below, but the curve is fit through them. So that's how you get the curve. So then when he saw that, he sort of relaxed and uh, understood what was, what was happening. So basically uh, those are projections backwards. And you, know, you maybe or others when doing this analysis more effectively than have I, uh, you will find that we're either right or wrong, you'll see but I trust that there'll be some validity for the dynamic that we have traced out over this period. Uh, okay, the one about China. Um, this question comes up all the time. Remember what I said about the United States? I said that in the 19th century, I could, give, I could be more specific, after the Civil War, the Grand Army of the Republic, which one of my parents, my great-great-grandfather fought in, um, that left the North with a huge army and it had a sizable Navy. It was the equivalent in size of any of the, and, and power of any of the European states at that point. But the United States wasn't part of the central system. Why was that? Because the United States didn't want to be part of the central system. We had something called the Monroe Doctrine, which I won't go into, which was wise advice that he said that the Europeans are all perfidious and dangerous, and they're much bigger than we are. That was the case in uh, 1780. Um, and uh, so don't get involved with them. And, and George Washington in his second farewell address said to his countrymen, don't get involved in European quarrels. We will be taken advantage of, we will be manipulated. They're, they're more, if they're not smarter than we are, they're bigger and they're more devious than we are. So they will, they will create problems for us. So that guided American policy through the whole 19th century. You know, by 1880, the United States had a Navy that was second to none in the world, even Britain, in terms of the power of the Navy. Maybe not, it wasn't as big, but it was a powerful Navy. Uh, but again, that didn't matter. Now, what about China? Well, my Chinese students say, this is a really biased analysis because you haven't included China in this analysis. And we know, that if we went back to the, say the uh, 16th century, 1500s, or the 14th century, the Chinese GDP, if anybody calculated it, would be the biggest in the world. Nobody else would have one as big as that. Of course, it was all based on peasants and the revenue drawn from peasants, but nonetheless, that, that, was, that was basically, there was some manufacturing, but not, not very much. Uh, now, why then isn't China involved? Why don't we draw it in? because China didn't want to be part of the central system. It was the middle kingdom. It was by itself. It was completely, there were, you know, uh, Marco Polo went to China. China didn't come to Europe. Uh, the Ming dynasty uh, had the biggest sailboats in the world. They were beautiful. They were, they, the European galleys were just tiny little boats. I sailed a boat as big as the boat that came to the United States or came to what we now call the United States, with, uh, led by Columbus. But the Chinese boats were huge. But the Chinese never took advantage of that. They didn't do any trading with Europe. Why was that? Because the Ming dynasty, the Ming emperor was very worried that the Europeans would take advantage of China. And you know what? He's probably right. He's probably, probably correct. So he withdrew 
and uh, and they gave up all those oper trading opportunities, all that capacity for for interaction. So what we have to say is this: China was not part of the central system, and by the 19th century, it was in a dilapidated state. Um, you know, by stay by avoiding the involvement, they probably avoided some wars with the, the perfidious Europeans, and maybe the Americans. Um, but they also were locked out of all kinds of ideas and all of their great inventions and they were had wonderful inventions just went for naught. They went to entertain the emperor but they didn't have any commercial impact at all. Uh, and so we can't include China into this period because it doesn't, it doesn't, have, doesn't amount to 5% of, um, of the GDP of an interactive system in the way that the, that the not the theory requires, but that world politics require. That's what's, that's the conditioner. And so uh, not until after World War II did uh, China really amount to very much in terms of great power politics. And even then, and people forget this, including my students from China, they forget that Mao was responsible for destroying 30 million people with his great leap forward. 30 million people died of starvation. Remember that. They still glorify him. But, and why did he do that? Because he didn't want to interact with the other uh, trading powers. He didn't want to adopt the system that the Deng adopted so successfully. And China paid a huge price for this. So not really until after Deng has, is there a point, a place where you can see China uh, the Chinese power cycle rising. That was a long answer to a very good question, set of questions. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, Burahan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Doran, thank you very much for your presence today. It was a very interesting presentation, especially I looked at it uh, before, the pre before this hour, but now it's even more interesting. Uh, with the graphs that you are showing, it even reminds me of aerodynamics with the vortexes and rotations in the power dynamics it's, and the regions being microclimates and everything. It, it mm -hmm. reminds me of that. But besides that, I would like to be asking you a question on uh, some one of my obsessions, which is the technological development. Uh, is, what kind of development? Technological development. Te technological development, yeah. Yeah, uh, you tried to frame the AI development in a sense that um, you use the index on basis of publications and the impact power of the publications, mm -hmm. number of publication and impact powers. Yeah. Uh, but there are some certain applications of artificial intelligence programs and certain technologies like quantum computing, which are like obtaining a nuclear weapon in 20th century. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it makes a huge jump in power dynamics and it creates um, maybe some opportunity for different like blocking another state's capability to, to obtain that. I mean, of course, if they disconnect from internet, they can still do that. But uh, there can be this kind of power nuking in terms of relative power gains uh, mm -hmm. in 21st century dynamics, especially considering the uh, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, data science, big data, that kind of dynamics. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask from this point on, uh, you know, the previous era was mostly um, mechanical and continuous uh, movements. But should we see um, or, or is it possible to see? A huge jump in terms of uh, power relations, power um, comparative power uh, re relations, and uh, the second one is currently we have non-formal bodies, non-formal non-state organizations, which are causing some power distortion, distortion within the international system. Mm -hmm. And what if we have um, a non-state actor which has power of an AI or uh, power of a global data set that it has under its control? Yeah, those are those are excellent questions. Uh, I do I am I correct by your accent that you're uh, uh, French? Uh, no, no, I, I'm Turkish. I, I have a mixed Turkish. accent. <laughs> Did you, were you were you educated? You have a bit of a French. Seeming to my ear, a bit of a French accent. Uh, uh, in any case, friend, I, I I, I, please, that's not an insult. <laughs> it's meant as a compliment. <laughs> uh, the uh, what I would say is this. Um, um, to the first question. Um, let's see, getting a little bit tired here. So I've got, I've got to focus um, 
your your first question was about the nature of of technology and technological change. I have uh, four children. We, my wife and I have four children. All of them became a variants of mathematicians, physicists, and so on. Uh, one of them actually did. It was when he was teaching at uh, ETH in, in Switzerland. Uh, he came. Up, he he did a paper, a theoretical math paper, which was not the ink wasn't dry before the physicists heard about it and said, this is exactly what we need in quantum computing. And they took the thing from him and applied it. That shows how dynamic technology is um, at this point. Um, what I would say is, um, is this, um, first of all, we're making an assumption here that uh, artificial intelligence is representative of technological change. Uh, and uh, the importance of technological change and the, and, the, and the recent nature of much of this change. Uh, some people may disagree with that, but, but we think that's important. Now, the, the, the other thing that is important here is how this affects countries. And you are absolutely correct that technological change will affect some countries more than others. I have to tell you right now, China is coming up against a different kind of wall. It's called a technological wall. They absolutely, they stole, and, and, and I just say it very plainly because if there were Chinese students and probably are in this group, I would say that, I say it to my students, they stole hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars worth of, of uh, intellectual property rights from firms. And that's what enabled them to really push forward so, so rapidly. But at this point, the stealing is not so easy and it's not so productive. Uh, and so they're gonna have to start innovating this for themselves. And that is a whole new ball game, as we say, for the baseball lovers, it's a whole new ball game. Uh, so they're gonna have to face that. And, but in fact, it, that means that, that, that uh, this question of technological innovation is different for each country. Now that's where something else comes into play here. And, and I've had a lot of time, a lot of difficulty actually explaining this to my confreres here in the United States in the political science community. They all, and the historians all think they know what relative power is. And in a way they do, but then when they apply it, they lose sight of what it is. They forget about it. And the economists have their own problems with relative and absolute. Uh, basically, they don't like relative. They don't live in a relative world. They live in an absolute world. Um, I can see uh, Professor Osgumar uh, uh, nodding. He understands exactly what that, what that means uh, uh, in, in trying to have discourse with them. Uh, and that's why we have a, a field of international relations where relative is very important and a field of economics where it, where it probably is not. Um, so the question of what the role of technological change is going to be is very important here. Uh, but also it's a constraint. There's a constraint here. When you are looking at everything in relative terms, then any individual contribution of an absolute sort is probably going to be matched by somebody else very shortly. So that's what's happened in terms of the nuclear field, you know. The United States came up with testing the, the atomic bomb first. Uh, three years later, the Soviet Union tested it. And I think it was almost the same kind of relation with a hydrogen weapon. So in other words, somebody else is coming along very soon after and, and, and doing the same thing. Yet, this isn't always the case. And so it's important to sort these things out uh, and, and as, uh, to the degree that one can. Uh, but uh, technological change normally gives an advantage to a country like the United States, because that's where the bulk of this, much of this stuff has originated and where there's a huge, very receptive community to the developing of ideas and also to the entrepreneurship, to the application of these ideas in commercial terms. Um, and it's in contrast to a number of other advanced industrial countries that don't have that same kind of setting. I think it's also in contrast to what China's gonna do. Because I can tell you, I watch very carefully what's happening in China uh, through reading everything I can get uh, on this. And I have to tell you that right now, 
Xi is causing the Chinese to turn inward. He's saying, we never want to be caught in the way that we were with regard to 5G. We want to produce everything we can, everything we need inside China. Well, the economists, our, our, our loved friends, loved friends, economists say it's impossible for one state to do everything. There's something called the, special, the, um, the notion of comparative advantage. You always have a comparative advantage. And so what people have said is if China decides to do this, instead of growing at say maybe 4% a year on average for the next decade, they'll only grow at 3% or 2.5%. They'll be giving up a lot. There's no way around that. So um, this is a t these are, this is a, a time where where China has to think about whether it wants to remain open or whether it wants to follow the the, the Ming Emperor and turn inward. And I tell my students stay open, and that's what Xi says to the world: the world should stay open. But meanwhile, he's closing China as fast as he can. So I, I think there are two messages going on here, and I I I actually believe his message at home rather than the public message he gives to others abroad. So that's that's where I would say uh, you stand with regard to technological change. It's got to be put in the context of relative power. And that is an e that is a hard task, but a very important one. Wonderful. Uh, Ali? Yeah, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Very well. Uh, OK, thanks. Uh, well, I have a question. Can I just interrupt you for a moment and say, congratulations to all you students. It's amazing. You're working in another language, not your own, and you're doing it brilliantly. So that's that's wonderful. So continue. OK. Uh, uh, I have um, two questions. Uh, they are short, but uh, so I can ask two questions, I guess. The uh, first one is on uh, power. So you already talked about uh, creating indexes and um, combining them to uh, define power, let's say. But my question is on um, which index contributes more to the definition of power and to to relative, to relative measurement of power relatively. I mean, uh, yeah, you may have great uh, militaries, I may have a great uh, economy, someone else may have a great economy that is integrated to world system more than mine, and some, some, some other actor may have um, great um, soft power, not military power, not economic power, but soft power. And the thing is, the more complicating thing is, um, one kind of power can really easily be translated to another form of power. I mean, you're, you can um, disband your military and create a great economy, or I can invest in military and create a great, uh, um, give up my economic power, but create a great uh, military. So. Um, how to compare uh, states with different kind of indexes, different kinds May of May I powers. take that question first before you get to the second question? Because yeah, I'll sure. get the second one if you, if, if you don't. Let, this okay. is a bit, yours is a very good question, okay? It's a very good question. And we have struggled with this many times. Now I have to tell you formally, the way we get around this is that we give each indicator equal weighting, equal weighting. Now. Somebody might say, this, Duran, we knew your theory was a bogus one, but this just proves it. This is, this is uh, something to, to reject. My response to them is this. Well, it might, that might be true. And you have the right to check and test our theory and see if it is true. And so what you could do is if you don't like the fact that we weighted everything equally, all each indicator equally, you could say military indicators are three times as more important than the economic indicators. And then you can see what the effect is. Now I can point to a data analysis that was done in Poland by people at the University of Warsaw, where I gave a lecture some years ago and have a, have a former student, very, very brilliant student uh, teaching. Um, and um, uh, they decided exactly that, that military indicators are three times more important than others. Now, I have only one small qualification here. How do you know it's three times? Maybe it's five times, maybe it's 10 times, maybe it's no times, you see, I don't know. Their response could be a good, an easy one. They could say, look, we'll try all those possibilities and see what the effects are. It's called sensitivity analysis in, in modeling. And there's nothing wrong with that. So they did it and what did they find? Exactly what you and I would have predicted. 
the United States becomes much more powerful because it has all this military capability. So if you like that outcome, then you can, that's the, th that's the way you can do it. But in any case, you ought to test it and see what the effects are. Um, and uh, uh, so I urge you to go ahead and at some point and, and do this kind of analysis and, and try, that, uh, try that testing. Okay, you had a second question. Uh, yeah, it is on the role of ideas. So uh, yes, throughout, yeah, the power, we look at power in a dynamic nonlinear uh, relative manner, yes. But uh, what about ideas regarding making war? I mean, at some times it is legitimate and even a global culture to make war. But at some other times, um, it is completely uh, delegitimized to make war. So um, yes, there might there might be cycles in uh, power, but if that cycle uh, cannot overlap with the cycle of norms and ideas, um, then the explanatory power of um, these cycles on power may be reduced. I mean, good, good. I, I understand the question well, and, and it's a it's a very good question. It's a very uh, effective way. And in fact, I can tell you, there are people in the United States working on this right now. There's a man by the name of Pinker who is a he classifies himself as a uh, evolutionary psychologist, whatever that is. He studies the brain, the way the brain evolves, uh, and he's written some very long works uh, arguing that in fact war is dying out and there's I've been part of a debate with a number of scholars on this same uh, theme um, and we now have data such that we can test these arguments and so on I could spend an entire lecture on this but I we don't have that time so all I would say is that um, there may be changes of attitude that affect the feasibility of war. I think there's one broad change, and that is when Hobbes wrote the Leviathan, which was in the latter half of the 17th century, during the Thirty Years' War between 1618 and 1648, or actually it was after that, but he'd lived through that war, and that's what influenced him. Hobbes argued that any kind of government is better than no government at all. Uh, Locke, of course, rejected that, didn't think that was such a good idea. And I'm very happy that we had Locke around. Um, but I, I, was, I will say that this, is, uh, this was very, uh, it's a very important observation. And in that, time, in that period, war was almost an annual event. You know, you put the crops in the ground and then went off and fought a war someplace. Uh, but you couldn't wait in the winter because it was too cold in the, and there was too much snow on the ground. You couldn't move cannon around. So, um, so but today, for most countries in the world, war is the exception, not the rule. And, and, and you know, thank God for that. That's, 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 uh, that is what we, we, uh, we, we uh, can uh, appreciate. Um, now that isn't true for every state. That's not true for every state. It is not true uh, for um, the United States. <laughs> the United States has been a lot involved in a lot of confrontations, but they haven't been big ones. And let me just contrast this. Look at the first half of the 20th century and what took place there. Contrast it with what took place between 1945 and the present. Big change, big difference. Now they're all the political scientists are busy trying to explain why that change took place. And I've got unfortunate news for them. Unfortunate news. I wish I didn't have to deliver this news. So don't shoot the messenger because the news is bad. But I have to tell you that there are too few cases of truly big war wars, worldwide wars, for us to make any generalizations about a pattern inside wars per se. We can say something about the relationship between the power cycle and the probability of war, because that's a more complex relationship. But if you're just looking at wars themselves, you're gonna say, all right, there were two in, in uh, the first half of the 20th century, will there be any in the, in, the, in the 21st century? We can't say anything statistically. There's no generalization. So I would have to say this exercise, which is so important, is rather futile.
at this point, using those kinds of techniques. So you could be right that the attitude toward war will conflict with all of this. But for what it's worth, I have a pious hope, pious hope that the lust for war for most countries has declined. And if you don't wanna accept that, then I urge you to study the Cuban Missile Crisis and see how close two great powers came to a nuclear war. And look at what kind of capability they had to destroy each other and most of the rest of the world too. And I think you'll agree with me, we don't wanna see a return of major war. We, 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 can't, we, can't, we can't tolerate it. So even those people whose morals haven't changed will look at, uh, unlike what Pinker says, um, they will look at the reality and say, we have to minimize the prospect that such a war could take place. The unfortunate reality, you know, I have to tell you a little anecdote here. There is a Russian or then Soviet naval officer who was on, and I could dig out his name, but it doesn't matter uh, for our, our purposes here. Uh, he, uh, he was on a, a nuclear submarine off the coast of the United States during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And there was a lot of surface activity going on, which they could, they could uh, detect. And, and they were worried about death charges and so on. The captain of this nuclear submarine, submarine with nuclear missiles on it, said, world war is breaking out. The Americans are launching attacks, nuclear attacks, and we have to release our weapons. He had lost contact with Moscow. There was no, in, no, inter, no communication back and forth. This other sailor, probably at the cost of his life, certainly at the cost of his career, said, no, the Americans are not launching a nuclear attack and we can't launch our weapons. He had the second key to release those weapons and he refused to use it. Well, my hat is off to that man. I wish that we could give him some kind of reward. If we did, the Russians would probably say, we knew it, he was an American spy. Uh, so nobody says anything, but uh, that took courage. And that's how close it was. So lest one get enthusiastic about warfare, think about what it means today in the 21st century. Okay, other questions? So we have two more students um, who would like to ask questions since um, Osgur Hoja told us that it's getting late and, and people have to teach tomorrow morning at eight. <laughs> <laughs> if we take those two questions at the same time, would that be okay? Sure, absolutely. Ishil and Ahmed. I, I probably will forget them, but you, you, you can help me, go ahead. Um, thank you, Professor, first of all, for being with us today. It was really an honor for us. Um, my question is regarding the graph that you showed us uh, presenting the dynamics of changing system structure. And I observed, I observed different patterns of power cycle for each state in it, meaning that for some states, it's it is slower to get in the high point and for others, it is more rapid and some states stay close to the high point for a longer Im amount of time. So my question is, does these differences have any significant effect for policy, foreign policy expectations of these states? Thank you. Well, that's a great question. And your, your observation is absolutely correct. Let me say this, these cycles are not deterministic. In other words, there's no program that is calculated to generate these cycles. There are no data that we are, have somehow mechanically pulled together that generate the cycles. They emerge by themselves out of history, out of the reality of the situation. They're all probabilistic and therefore wars themselves associated with them are probabilistic. Um, now, what does that therefore mean? Yes, you know, the Netherlands was a very rich state in 1680. I love the, the Dutch 
uh, painters, for example, Rembrandt and uh, Van Dyck and all of these brilliant painters, uh, who, by the way, were paid very well by the rich uh, bourgeois of the period. Um, but, um, but in any case, uh, what, I would, what I would say is um, that the, the Netherlands couldn't possibly ultimately contend with the big powers. And in the Dutch-British, Dutch-English trade wars, the Dutch were smashed and they just gave up that confrontation and because they were squeezed between the much more powerful French and the much more powerful British. So whether one has a high amplitude or a long periodicity doesn't have so much to do with um, even with the actions of states, although it has some, uh, it certainly has a lot to do with the endowments that the state has and how they're used and how well the economies are uh, you know, employed and, and how the state conducts itself in that sense is important. And I guess the, the, the test case would be uh, Russia where it declined in the 19th century. Well, even though it had been at a peak in terms of its power earlier. Um, so that's just a function of the, of the reality of economics and security and world politics and military spending and so on at a point in time. Thank you so much, and Ahmed? Okay. Professor Lauren, thank you for being with us. Uh, it's an honor. Uh, we saw in the graph that France and Britain were at their peak in the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, can we say Britain and France out of central power system now? And if they are out of the central power system, uh, how can we explain their existence in the permanent five of the UN Security Council? Thank you. Okay. Well, let me take the latter uh, point first. Uh, um, I don't know if your comments were calculated to knock them out of the uh, of that that uh, UN Council. Um, I don't want to take part in that discussion, but uh, all I will say is when the UN was created, uh, they had every right to be where they were, uh, but today their power is a fraction of their relative power is a fraction of what it was then because other big powers have emerged. And so they're in a much different situation. Now, don't tell them that I'm making an argument for kicking them out of the Security Council as a permanent member. Um, the, uh, uh, what would I say about uh, their power uh, more generally? Well, we look at that and it, and it is just, it is reflected in what we have seen for the first, using the first data set over the period that we looked at. When we did use the second data set, you, you know, you just splice these data sets together. Economists do the same thing with GDP. They splice the GDPs together because the bu buggy whip industry is not very big anymore. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, creating, uh, uh, well, artificial intelligence is a big industry at this point. So you have to combine these and split and splice them together. And that's what we did in terms of the cycles. And when you do that, the story is the same. Uh, the European states in world terms are not able to compete with the great continent-sized states. Uh, so, uh, so, but, but what they, and they know this, so that's why they, in part, why they formed the European Union, be able to compete at, on a world scale and provide security and protect themselves. Uh, so, um, and that's why we have NATO, for example, which uh, we are proud to say Turkey is a member of. So, so uh, that that those that kind of uh, that kind of uh, uh, role is uh, is defined by circumstance and and relative power is uh, a factor for all these states and in, and when states decline in relative power if they are below five percent of the of the power of the central system we have to drop them out now what's an example of that Austria Hungary we see was out of the central system before World War One began. It already had lost that much power. I don't know if you study it carefully. It's a very interesting state. It had terrible bloody wars in the 19th century, most of which it lost, especially against the Prussians who were pretty brutal competitors. So uh, I, think, um, I think that uh, 
uh, that's the reality that we have to we have to contend with if we're going to do this analysis in an honest way. On the other hand, states can form alliances, and they do and they will, uh, to protect themselves in terms of security if they're smaller and they're more vulnerable. And indeed, if you look at the European Union, if it is successful and moves forward, um, it will be a very powerful actor. In fact, I can see a situation in the, as far as great powers are concerned, in the middle of the 21st century. You can say when Dur Duran is long gone, but this is what he said, and either he's right or he's wrong. <laughs> I can see a situation in the middle of the 21st century where North America is one center of power, Europe, you know, whatever, however it's constituted, however it's reflected and so on, it's another center of power. And China is a third center of power. And there might be relative equality among those power centers. That's of course the kind of thing that we're looking into and in, in trying, to, trying to assess without the genius of de Tocqueville, I might add. Thank you very much, Professor Duran. I think we're gonna um, we're gonna call it a day here in terms of asking questions. But um, I wanted to thank you on behalf of our entire department, um, our students, for everything you have shared with us tonight. It was a very insightful, very thought provoking talk, and we really hope that once situation comes back to a semblance of norm normality, that you will honor us with your presence as well. This was really great. So I would like everybody to join me in giving Professor Duran a round of applause uh, for his amazing presentation. Um, <laughs> and we are going to post this on YouTube on our channel. You can uh, we will send it to you as well. Um, and we're we're going to keep watching it. We're going to come back to it uh, for our classes on on power cycle theory. Um, and, uh, and, and for other uh, activities that our students are concerned with. So without um, any further ado, thank you once again. This was really fantastic. Thank, You've been most you. generous. It was a great pleasure. And I'm gonna take you up on the invitation to visit you physically after the COVID is over with, okay? I hope as early as next year, sir. Yeah, I certainly agree. <laughs> All right, bye-bye. Thank, thank you for everything. Thank you, yeah. good night. Thank <laughs> you.